Artists are some of the most underappreciated and abused and abused individuals in the YouTube community. They make our content look more professional. They work on our branding. They make fan art for free just as their way to participate in the community. And we want to say thank you for that today. Before we can offer any merch, someone needs to design it. Now, the devil wanted to design our merch, and I've got a few ideas for what I think would look cool on a shirt, but I knew we'd be better off hiring artists to make sure that this looks good. I was the first artist. Okay, look at this shirt. I made this in the 70s for a friend's band. Look at how that plays in the light. This was a limited edition run. Look at that. You know how much glitter we went through to make these? Nobody's glittering anymore. Look at that. Nobody, nobody does glitter shirts. I did this without Photoshop. Our goal is to make some cool graphic tees for our merch line. And we're now at the step where we need to gather the art. This is episode two in our Try Hard series about how to make merch. And today, we're focusing on commissioning art. Last time we talked about merch and fashion lines created by YouTubers. And we determined what made good merch special and what made bad merch awful. Having original artwork is a must and stealing Google images is offensive. Before I'd ever hired a freelance artist, I had some questions. Where do I find an artist? How much is that gonna cost? What if they make something I don't like? Can I ask for changes? Will I owe them a percentage of every sale forever or can I just buy the art outright? We'll answer all those questions and then I'll tell you about the artists we hired and show you what they made us. All of them told me that they may be willing to work on your projects too. All of their contact information is in the description below. Of course, these artists might get too busy or maybe you're just looking for a different style. So let's back it up a step and talk about how to find artists. Elvis the Alien, who we discovered makes some of the best merch available, Alien Clothing, told me that he found his primary artist from a contest he started on designcontest.com. Kind of a funny story, I started Alien through freelancer.com. I was like, I have this amount of money, whoever can draw me something that I think kind of matches what I have in my head, then, then yeah, I'll choose you. And out of like 20 people, Adriel like hit it right on the fucking nose. He created E.T. Hawk, Parasite, uh, Tommy Ten Tongues, Choking. In fact, he helped me create the entire first set of alien clothing. Now, the way that these contests work on sites like Design Contest and Freelancer.com and other similar sites is that you create a guaranteed prize and the designers upload their submissions until you pick a winner. You can pick first, second, and third place, but only the winner gets the money. You do get the option to contact any runners up and negotiate with them to buy their designs too for an additional cost. Obviously, the bigger you make the prize, the more designers will throw their hats in the ring. Both of the sites I mentioned suggest making a prize between $200 and $600. The big upside to running a contest is that you'll get to see a lot of different options for one price. Those sites are pretty cool but that's not how we did ours. At least for our first round of designs, I wanted to have more of a direct impact on who submitted art. So I spent the past couple years scouting freelance artists on Twitter. Twitter has a large artist community, including comic book artists, character designers for video games, painters, custom fetish artists, just about any kind of artist that you can imagine. Unfortunately, for our purposes, not every artist on Twitter is for hire. If the DMs are open, it doesn't hurt to ask, but there is a way at a glance to find out who's looking for clients. We want to find the phrase commissions open. Now, if you see that in their bio or a commission sheet as their pin tweet, well, that's an invitation to offer them a deal. Whenever someone's art caught my eye and their profile mentioned commission art, I added them to a list. Twitter has this very useful feature where you can organize profiles into a custom list. The big list I made is called Commission Artists. You're welcome to look through it and I link that in the description below. Out of this big list, I contacted 22 artists and offered them the job. 13 of them took the job. Now, most of our commissions went great and I have a lot of recommendations to make. Some of those transactions did not go well at all. Now, when we explain who those artists were, please don't send them any hate. You might even have a positive experience with them. Just take ours as a single bad review. Our perspective is the client's perspective. So to be fair, I asked our recommended artist after the gig was complete, what makes their dream client and what makes the nightmare client? 
and their answers provided a lot of insight about the do's and don'ts. One of the things that many of our artists mentioned is that a dream client should be a fan of their work. So don't hire an artist if you're not really a fan of the choices that they usually make. If you are unsure about them and you hire them, well, you might get lucky and you might not, and that's not really gonna be their fault. I know that I've looked over some portfolios and tried to talk myself into the artists, you know, tried to tell myself that they could make something that there's no evidence they've ever done before. Don't do that. Look over their recent work and make sure that you're, I don't know, at least 90% convinced that they can make what you want. The next step is briefing the artist. A client should explain what they need help with exactly and pitch their ideas in a way that'll get the artist excited to start. According to our survey, the most important factor to being the dream client and not the nightmare client is clarity. Makes sense when you think about it. An artist needs to take an idea out of your brain and then make it a reality. So in order to help them succeed at that, decide what you want beforehand and describe it as precisely as possible. Visual examples are a big help. Vague requests, on the other hand, lead to being a nightmare client. Words mean different things to different people. For example, if you say, I want this design to feel 80s. Well, the designer might be thinking hair metal for 80s, and you're thinking new wave aesthetic. So add as much clarity as possible to avoid unpredictable results. We talked it over and decided on four subjects for t-shirts. The death mask from Tryhards, Dr. Downvote, Ask the Devil, and Nikki as a heavy metal succubus. At this step, you're gonna write up your job specs and then create an album with some example pictures. One of the artists we hired, Faf9, explained that mood boards are another good way to show an artist like him what you're looking for. Mood boards are the most useful thing in any design ever, and I don't think many YouTubers realize that. If you have like a mood board or general aesthetic, like different PNGs or different wallpapers saying, this is the aesthetic that I'm looking for. This is the kind of text I'm looking for. Take inspiration from this. With a merch design, you need to have the idea first so the artist can actually make it. Oh, I want something that's cute and innocent. And cute and innocent to that person could mean something completely different. So I, in terms of nightmare clients, this person didn't give me much. He All he said was, surprise me. As an artist, you want to know what you're looking for, what like pitch the idea to the artist so that they can bring it to life. I sent out an initial contact to our artist that read like this. If the artist wrote back interested, I sent out a reply with more information that looked like this. Now you'll notice that I'm being clear up front that this art is for channel merch. Our intention is to put this stuff on products that will be sold. The best thing to do is to send over a release that makes that permission perfectly clear. At this point, an artist would typically quote their rate or else I would ask them, how much would you like to be paid for this? Rates will always differ between artists, and there's a lot of reasons that can justify that. Some art styles just take longer to complete. Some artists already have a lot of demand on their time, so they charge more. If I was happy with the work, I usually tipped on top of their asking price. Tipping is common in commission art, although not expected. It's also very important to set a time frame for the job because open-ended jobs will stretch on forever. Whenever the artist asks me, when do you need this done? I usually said 20 days. It's overcomplicated and not necessary to offer royalties. So when do you pay an artist? Do you pay everything up front? Do you pay in stages as the job is completed? Or do you only pay at the end when it's totally done? Some artists, they'll want prepayment. And it's understandable if they've been burned in the past, but it should be avoided. As a general rule of thumb for all contract work, if you prepay for services, you remove the incentive for them to finish the job. And then you gotta count on some other motivation to get it done. That could be their reputation, it could be karma, fear. fear. It could be the golden rule. Psychologically, it's less effective. You lose your leverage as the client. In fairness, I have a better collection department than most. But if you were to pay a guy before he went to work, well, we guarantee he showed up. Now, I knew better, but just for the sake of this experiment, when any of these artists asked for prepayment, I prepaid them. Three of them asked. I'll show you what happened. Artist number one asked for 50% down each time a new drawing was started. This guy came through every time and worked quickly. That was Lamp Black. Artist number two asked for 100% payment up front before starting any of the sketches. I suggested 50% down payment. They agreed. And so I sent it. That was a year ago. <laughs> they forgot. A few months ago, I was sent a DM to let me know they forgot. And then they forgot again. As of today, I have not yet been refunded 
my 50% deposit. Artist number three was sent the job specs last March and asked for a prepayment in April. I agreed and he completed the job eight months later. Hearing back from him became unpredictable. He explained that he took on other clients and the whole gig lost so much momentum that both of us became slower to reply to each other, much more so than in any of my other transactions. Some of that was me. But after we'd settled on a price for merch designs and I'd paid for half up front, this artist edited the existing invoice on PayPal to add another 30 pounds without telling me. So when I paid the second half, at first I didn't notice that additional money had been tacked on, but I did notice it eventually. And when I asked him about it, he said, that's just my policy, which is available on my website. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. The three digital artists that I've shown his work to are convinced that the technique he delivered to me is an overpaint. A layperson might call overpainting, tracing, and drawing over top. I asked the artist about how he did this one-to-one -one accurate technique. Down to the smallest detail when you zoom in, he said no overpainting, that this was all drawn by hand. So in conclusion, in two out of three cases, prepayment up front was a bad idea. I would recommend saying this. I'm not comfortable prepaying, but I have budgeted for your invoice and I will send payment promptly after delivery. But if they still really insist and you really wanna hire them, offer, would it be all right if I sent a partial down payment after I see the sketch? Pushing back on the prepayment puts the risk back on the artist. So you really need to be a good client. If the merch becomes a regular thing, you may wanna do some more work with them in the future. And if they had a bad experience, they're gonna say no or they're gonna bump your job out of the queue so they can work with somebody they like. Most artists will do a sketch first after they've absorbed the job requirements and gotten an idea of how to proceed. It's usually very rough, it's not in color, and it's only meant for very broad feedback, such as, am I on the right track? What they really wanna know is, if I fill this in and I make it look really pretty, do you see anything about this composition that's not gonna work for the final project? If you do see a problem, now is the time to tell them. If you're sent work that needs feedback, provide it right away as soon as you see the message. Then they can keep in the flow on your work and they won't have to start looking for another project because their client is procrastinating. The next step is the comp itself. Now, this is where 80% of the artist's work on the project will be done. The art is created as close to the final product as possible and then feedback is requested. If details need to be adjusted, like colors changed or text moved, a client should send all of those notes at once. Revisions, generally speaking, are where an artist and a client are gonna make or break their relationship. Without changes, the client might not be happy with the art. And likewise, if too many changes are asked for or asked for in a rude way, then the artist might never wanna work with that client again. Yes, you're giving them money, but just remember, artists have feelings. Artwork, even for pay, is somewhat personal. Part of it came from the artist, so praise what you like about it. If you give only criticism, that can be very crushing to the artistic spirit. Don't be stingy with the compliments. They made this thing so that you would like it. They want you to like it. Now, if you have some changes that are hard to swallow, and you're not really sure how to serve them up. Brightest management technique I invented a little while back called the compliment sandwich. You can convince anybody to eat almost anything if it's part of a well-crafted sandwich. It goes something like this. Wow, this is amazing. So is that. Maybe you could flip this layer because I think it'll work better for my purposes. But wow, this is incredible. I love it. I am so happy. Tell them what you like. Tell them what you'd like to see more of. And then tell them what you like. During the finishing stage, an artist will make the changes that were requested. The client knows what they're getting, and the job is about 95% done. This is a good time to send over their payment. The final stage is delivery. The artwork files are sent over, and the commission is now complete. The only thing left to do is download the file, make sure that it opens in Photoshop or whatever the case may be, and to verify that all the revisions were made as requested. Now, if they weren't made correctly, you can still straighten that out at this phase. But if new feedback is given at this stage that was not mentioned in the revision stage, this is where an artist might start to get frustrated. This is where you start to become the nightmare client. New requests become a second revision, and it's not uncommon for artists to ask for more money if a completed project gets kicked back into an active project by late requests. Don't withhold your praise at the end as a negotiating tactic. Once they do the work, don't be a jerk and pretend that you're not gonna use it just so you can get the price lower. Once you've picked an artist 
and you've agreed on a price. That money is already spent. Unless the artist acts in, let's call it bad faith, pay the price you agreed. Some of the art that we bought will probably never get used on merch. And that's okay. Let's take a look at the art anyway. Number one, Omega Black. If you follow cursed image accounts or visit creepy subreddits, then you've probably met Omega Black's Monster Garfield. When I hired Mr. Black, I said, here are my two favorite shirts. I'm hoping you could design one with my skull on it. And he said, we'll be right back. He came back with my two new favorite shirts. I can smell you. Number two, Death Think. Death Think's line art is hyper detailed. He didn't just draw me exploding on a scooter, he littered it with Easter eggs related to this channel. He also hand painted a font for us rather than use an existing font, which is actually an option, Jake. When it comes to input from the client, Death Think is an anomaly on this list in that he really doesn't want any. He wants to be given space and then turned loose. So ideally, you would tell him nothing. He's at a point in his career where he is willing to take commission work, but only if he believes in the client. You may try to choose Death Think, but in the end, Death Think must choose you. Number three, Chris Linack. Chris's aesthetic reminds me of MTV in the 1990s. Everything Chris makes looks gross, but in a playful, cartoonish way. His ideal client lets him experiment a little bit with their concept, which only makes sense because with the way he sees the world, a mutated version of whatever you send him is what you should expect. Number four, Ultra Joe. If you listen to the Baited podcast, then you're probably just as familiar with Ultra Joe's work. The caricatures he does of YouTubers have become legendary. Joe puts it simply, a dream client comes with ideas, and a nightmare client wants something cool, but doesn't know what. <laughs> Number five, Cyan Gorilla. Cyan Gorilla's fantasy paintings look like they jumped off of a Magic the Gathering card. So if you're in need of some art that doesn't look like it came from planet Earth, talk to the Green Gorilla. You'll have to pause this on a large screen if you want to read the books he wrote. Number six, Bath Nine. Fellow YouTuber and graphic designer Thaf9 may be the best in the world at making movie posters for movies that don't exist. So when I needed a full page ad for Rusty Cage's comic book, I hit up Thaf. He likes to work with high resolution images and he was not pleased with the folder I sent everyone else. So we shot new photos for Thaf and sent them in raw format, just like he likes. And that was worth every bit of extra effort because he took those photos and made this in less than a day. We've been using Thaf's poster to test print-on-demand companies, and a very nice printing of it is available at nerd.city right now. Number seven, Katrine Saru. Katrine is an art student from Iceland who caught my attention with these nasty pinups. So I figured, who better to try and capture the appeal of our own nasty demon? Katrin is a tinkerer. I was shown draft after draft, which I approved every time, and every time she'd come back with something a little bit different and a little bit better. She may have a few extra steps to her creative process, but I've come to believe every step she takes in a day is part of her creative process. She'll draw a crazy cartoon, and then a few days later, her face looks like that. Which is obviously a peculiar hobby, right? But weirdness is not necessarily a bad sign if you're in the market for art. In her case, her creativity is clearly pushing her hard and she goes with it and that's what we pay to tap into. To be Katrin's dream client, know what you want, show examples, answer questions, and have patience. Number eight, Eliza Hallsworth. Eliza is currently heartbroken after discovering that a painting she purchased in a thrift store for next to nothing was an unknown work by famous painter Margaret Cohen and is worth quite a bit of money. Museums would want it. Unfortunately, Eliza had already painted over the signature and changed the colors when she saw Cohen's work in a museum and figured out what she'd done. You know what they say about paintings of flowers, right? Well, not much can be said about the dripping eggplants Eliza painted for us. I'd love to show you this whole painting, but I have to censor it because her emojis are so obscenely veiny. Eliza H. describes the ideal pitch as seduction. I think it's safe to say she's the horny or something. Lamp black. All right then. Lampy is a bit of a bogan, so I don't always understand what he's trying to tell me. Good luck yourself trying to understand that last sentence. Lamp black is the Aussie poster. 
as scrambled as his old brain may seem, in his files his layers are lovely. He keeps his layers in order and he's got heaps of them, hey? Which makes any edits easy. I'm sure you can see by how many times I've hired him, over and over and over. His time is worth every penny. Number 10. Worm Boy. Worm Boy either is staying in character most of the time, or is a demonic worm. Hard to say. First time I talked to him, he did hiss at me. A bit. I suppose I'd describe his art style as, aw, that's spooky, whatever it's called. It is influential, which I can't blame him for losing his patience about sometimes. Worm Boy's commissions have been seen on playing cards, video game merchandise, all kinds of products. He built out a whole world of these characters, so if I had to guess, he's bound to end up working on like a comic book or a video game or a TV series eventually. His commission status flicks on and off, so if you see it on, swoop in. in. Early Bird gets the work with the worm boy looking back on history every civilization is judged by the art it leaves behind it's the artists that stand out after the wars it's the artists that are remembered a culture is judged by the art How will your culture be remembered? When you find an artist that you like, support them. Before we go, I want to thank a good friend of the channel, Skillshare. A number of people have signed up to Skillshare and asked me, what's a good general knowledge course for Adobe Premiere? In other words, if I'm new at editing, where's a good place to start? When I joined Skillshare, I was already pretty familiar with Adobe products, so the courses I've been watching are more specific and related to design. But I want to have a good answer to that question. So I've been watching beginner courses related to Premiere. There are numerous options for learning Adobe and Skillshare, but out of those, the one I would recommend is Video Editing with Adobe Premiere Pro for Beginners by Jordi Vandeput. One of the things that I appreciate about Skillshare is that pros make these tutorials, and Jordi has been teaching Adobe Premiere for 10 years now. He's also a YouTuber with 1.4 million subscribers. One of my own patrons who needed to learn Adobe Premiere mentioned that he took this exact Skillshare course and loved it. One thing I noticed that impressed me is how responsive Jordy is. If you ask him a question under the video, he answers in the same day. See, this one was answered one day ago, another one same day, another one from the same day. That's a great resource then if you get stuck in the course. The instructor is present. You are here to learn Adobe Premiere Pro. Good choice. Jordy is like PewDiePie and Brad combined into one person. Skillshare will let you try out their site for free and take any of these courses for one month. But if you follow the link below, slash nerdcity5, you'll get two free months to try it out. I do like Skillshare and they've been patiently waiting for me to upload. Hopefully they'll forgive me for how long this video took. As you can see, it took so long to finish this video that I have a beard now and I didn't when it started. Please subscribe and hit the bell if you're new to this channel. Thought Patrol is next. Oh, baby, I'm celebrating. Can't wait to crush their imaginary bone.